Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is David Jordan. I am one of the co-directors of the Freeman Air and Space Institute, and welcome to this event. Uh, we have, of course, a number of you joining us, uh, and the numbers go up uh, with every word I speak. And I will intend to start in uh, just a couple of minutes at 1600 hours to allow the maximum number of people to have joined. We are on the hashtag, hashtag Freeman Space. If uh, any of you have any uh, Twitter uh, observations to make, please. I regret because of the size of the audience today, uh, we won't be able to take uh, individual questions. There are somewhere in the region of a thousand people who have signed up for the event. Uh, so as you can imagine, a fairly large attendance. We're very grateful to all those of you who are attending. I must also express my gratitude to Airbus for their kind support for this event and to uh, our two principal guests, of course, uh, Air Vice Marshal Harv Smith and Air Vice Marshal Paul Godfrey. Uh, the conversation that they have will be moderated and led by my colleague, Dr. Sophie Antrobus. And I'm also pleased and very grateful uh, to Air Chief Marshal uh, Sir Mike Wigston, the Chief of the Air Staff, who uh, needs no introduction to any of you, of course, who's also uh, agreed to say a few words to open the event. Um, this is very kind of him to do so, particularly given his inevitably busy schedule and Sir Mike, we're most grateful uh, for that. Uh, and indeed, um, Sir Mike, if I may, uh, could I please hand over to you now uh, and uh, to say to everyone else, please enjoy the event. Thank you. David, uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the Freeman Air and Space Institute for uh, organising this event, which I can see from the numbers has had a remarkable response, so, so very well done. I, I probably don't need to tell this audience that space really matters and, and uh, space matters to all of us in our private and in our professional lives, but that's not something that's probably recognised by large parts of our public and I think we all have a collective responsibility to raise that level of awareness because space is changing and space is changing fast and, and the, the opportunities are literally infinite, but we're also seeing some questionable, reckless activity. We're seeing uh, equipment being fielded in space and on, on the earth uh, directed at space, which has all of the characteristics of a weapon. Now, we understand what our potential adversaries are doing and we understand why they're doing that. They've, they've watched us, they've watched our dependencies uh, from a military perspective on space. They've, they've recognized how space gives us that, that uh, vital advantage and that, that, that combat edge. And so why wouldn't they seek to deny us that, uh, that important advantage and, and seek to make us more vulnerable as a result? And so that's why the Prime Minister's determination and ambition that the UK should be a leader in space is so welcome. And in particular, the announcement that uh, the Ministry of Defence and the Royal Air Force would be establishing Space Command is something that I think is a hugely important step. We're here today to hear from, uh, not from me, from two Air Vice Marshals, our first Director of Space in the Ministry of Defence, Air Vice Marshal Hart Smith, and, and our first opportunity to, to hear from Air Vice Marshal Paul Godfrey, the first UK Space Commander. And I think on, ev on behalf of everybody who's tuned in today, I, I, uh, I wish um, him every best of luck in his, uh, in, in his new appointment and our heartfelt congratulations. Knowing those two officers as we do, They'll have a lot to say, it will be hugely entertaining and we all look forward to hearing what they say. I should also congratulate FASI for your immaculate timing coming one week after the integrated review where our ambition in space was restated as a, as a nation, but also coming the day after the Defence Command Paper in which you will have seen an additional 1.4 billion pounds of investment in our space programmes in the Ministry of Defence over the next 10 years on top of the five billion that we're already going to be putting towards uh, Skynet 6. Harv and Paul will no doubt go into more detail, but for me, this gives us an opportunity to establish the military command and control 
that we need so that we can better understand what is going on in space so that we can share that information with our commercial partners and our international partners with a like-minded network of, of nations, both military and commercial. It gives us the, the ability to, to build equipment that gives us that better understanding of what's going on in space and it, and it will enable us to continue with our ambition to create a sovereign uh, ISR constellation in due course. And, and, and not forgetting, of course, the people that we will need as part of this enterprise. So again, a key part of that is the establishment of a space academy. I'm, I'm really proud that the Royal Air Force has been given that responsibility to, to deliver the UK's first space command on behalf of the Ministry of, of Defence, on behalf of the nation. We will do it alongside the Army, Navy, and of course, UK STRATCOM. And we will do it with people from the civil service, from across government, from, from industry, and of course, all three services. It's a really exciting time. It, it's generated a huge amount of interest just, just looking at the, the numbers that have tuned in today alone. And, and it's not overstating it to say that it is, for the Royal Air Force, a key waypoint in our history and something that, I, that I'm sure that in decades to come, people will look back on this period and the establishment of a meaningful and effective capability in space as another step in the Royal Air Force's journey through, through air and space. So thank you very much for today. And I hand over to Sophie now, who's going to convene the discussion. Good afternoon, everybody. It's absolutely fantastic to have so many people attending this event. And my enormous thanks to Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston, Chief of the Air Staff, for joining us today. Really great to have you uh, as part of our event. I'd also, of course, like to thank Airbus, who are our partners for this event. Uh, and I'd like to remind everybody here who's attending, if you're on Twitter, uh, please use hashtag Freeman Space uh, to comment on and talk about this event. So I, I'm, without further ado, I'm going to get on with introducing uh, Air Vice Marshal Harv Smith and Air Vice Marshal Paul Godders Godfrey. Great to have them with us. Uh, their careers actually have followed similar trajectories, both qualifying as frontline Harrier pilots. Harv as Station Commander RAF Marham, retrained on the Tornado and later as AOC One Group, also converted to the Typhoon. God has also retrained on the Typhoon, taking command of RAF Lossiemouth in 2015. Both followed their station commands with spells and MOD, heading up carrier-enabled power projection, and an Aludade at the USAF Combined Air and Space Operations Center. Harv was appointed Director Space in the MOD in 2020, and God has takes up command of Space Command next week on the 1st of April, also the 103rd birthday of the RAF very momentous event as Kaz has already alluded to. We're really pleased they're joining the Freeman Air and Space Institute for their first public in conversation event at this important time for UK space power. The conversation will be followed by questions from a panel of defense and space professionals. But first I'll kick off with a question to get the conversation going between Harv and Goddard. It's just a week until Space Command stands up. Can you tell us a bit more about the genesis of the Space Directorate and now of Space Command? Over to you. Thank, thanks, Sophie. That's uh, probably one for me to start and then I'll hand it off to Goddard. And uh, before I get going, just thanks very much for the opportunity. It, uh, it's brilliant to be doing this with FASI, really exciting. And um, you know, I have a close connection with the FASI group. So uh, it's, it's cracking that we're having this chance today. And for me to do my first public engagement with Godders, I just, you made me smile there. I hadn't, I hadn't put two and two together on how close our careers have been to get to this point. I'm just glad that we did deconflict before we uh, came online here and I chose the blue shirt and he didn't. So that's good. So you can tell us apart. Um, the journey to where we are today has been, uh, it's been a really interesting year. This time last year, we didn't have a space directorate, we didn't have a director, we didn't necessarily have a plan, we certainly didn't have any money. Um, and in fact, in the, in the bigger scheme of things, we didn't necessarily have 
good cross government governance on space or a, a, a good understanding of where we were going. Yes, there was lots going on, um, but not necessarily done in a coherent way. And many people will have heard me at different sessions over the year talk about our quest for coherency. And I think here we are a year in, and we're definitely there. I, I do think we're, we're firmly on that path to delivering coherency, uh, both in terms of cross-government, but also importantly, for the dining in of our own department through defense. And the stand-up of Space Command is a real uh, seminal moment there as we put that final piece in, a, in this puzzle. I, I would also just reflect on what, uh, what the Chief said there right at the start. Uh, you know, here we are with the announcement just yesterday of the command paper where we've publicly laid out what our plans are. So a year in where we've come from a relatively blank sheet of paper, uh, we've got the money that we need now to put in place a very exciting and ambitious uh, defence space programme that is more than where we've been before, which was uh, to all extents you know, our major program being Skynet. And we have ambitions to do way more than that uh, and to use Space Command as the vehicle to deliver it. Everything from sovereign space domain awareness, uh, free space optical comms, laser communications, the National Space Ops Center, a digital backbone through a program uh, which we're calling the uh, Defense Space Game Changer, which is being run through our R&D department. Uh, an ambition to establish our own UK built and UK launched uh, LEO uh, small stack constellation for multispectral surveillance. Uh, we're looking at uh, different options for space control and protecting defence mission. Uh, and uh, again, Kaz touched on this idea of a space academy and Goddard and I have already had some fantastic conversations with the likes of Harwell on how we can leverage some of the great work that's already going on across the enterprise in terms of a uh, space workforce generation. So it's been a hugely busy year for us. Um, it's not often you get a chance to, to take a breath and reflect back on what has gone on in a year. And you know, our focus has mostly been on COVID and how we live in these strange times, but I'm enormously proud of the team in that we've been able to deliver this uh, especially since we've done the vast majority on uh, things like this, like Zoom calls, et cetera. So it just shows you what you can do, do remotely if you really put the effort in. So I'm incredibly proud of where we've got to. Now's the time to turn what was that proposition into a program. We're just about to sign off the uh, financial delegation letters in terms of this is the program, here's the money, now get on and deliver it and all being well in week's view, that will be delivered to Goddard's. And then he has the very exciting and the pivotal moment as, as the chief talked about, of taking all of that and setting the Air Force and broader defense in terms of delivering space for defense on the path to a, to a new defense space program. So a hugely exciting year, even more exciting years to come. Uh, on that point, I'll shut up and I'll hand off to Goddard's, I'm sure he's got a view. Goddard's. Yeah, thanks, Harv. Um, not a huge amount more to add. You know, certainly I'm sure it isn't just the shirts that people will be able to tell the difference uh, between us. Secondly, in order to, uh, you know, I'm enormously privileged to be the, uh, uh, the inaugural commander of, uh, of Space Command. Clearly, I'm a technical person. Currently, I'm looking at an iPad that sat on a cardboard box leaning against the window in, a, uh, in an upstairs room in the house. Um, but uh, you know, the only addition I would make on the actual question in terms of the genesis um, is just a thank you to you guys in Space Directorate. Clearly, we don't want this to be, you know, too much back slapping. But the I I know that you had to start the Space Directorate yourself. You know, so you started that from scratch, even before Space Command was a conversation. So to put together what you did, get it through uh, you and the team through the processes that you have managed to. Um, this is way more than PowerPoint deep. I've just taken on uh, the senior responsible owner for the change, what is termed the change program to stand up Space Command. Um, and it is pretty fully formed. It's way more than PowerPoint deep, as I mentioned. You know, there's funding there, there's structures, um, there's personnel coming on board. So, 
you know, whilst it's really exciting, uh, I think you've done the difficult bit. I've kind of got the easy bit or clearly the difficult bit if the chief is uh, is still listening. Um, but, uh, you know, a really exciting time, you know, just in terms of timeline, it's probably worth mentioning. Um, we brought a few, but we've got about 15 people in the command right now, and that is really administrative. Um, and then when we get to the 1st of April, um, we're actually going to form at that point. We're not going to stand up until uh, early June um, when we've actually got a headquarters available to get into uh, and do all those sorts of things. I'll talk a bit more about what we're going to do um, uh, later on in the uh, in the questioning, I'm sure. Uh, but then we, we don't even reach initial operating capability um, until April next year. So enormously exciting. There's a huge amount of work to be done right at the beginning, um, but it is very slow steps as we form this, uh, this command and move forward. Um, I'll pause there because I know we've got a, uh, a few questions coming in and they're so... Yeah, just uh, I wondered if you could um, both reflect on your thoughts on the division of responsibility that there's going to be between your two roles and organisations and how you're going to coordinate. I'm assuming you've been discussing that already. Yeah, shall I shall I go first, God? Yeah, yeah. I, was on a, I was on a call earlier and uh, as God has just uh, described, you know, we've kind of this has been fast and furious through this last year to get this all landed. Um, so there is a certain amount of, you know, letting the baby go, handing the baby off to Godders. I can't think of anyone better to hand it off to, so that's good. And for those of you that don't know, you know, Godders and I do go way back. We joined the Air Force together on the very same day. We flew on our first squadrons together at Larbrook. Um, you know, we've kind of followed to the point where our kids even went to the same school. So it is it's all a bit strange but that, we're, that we've ended up here together but I can't think of anybody uh, better to hand this uh, this all off to. For us in the space directorate what that means is the role that we've been doing specifically on the capability side uh, we will start to go more hands off there and delegate that out of MOD Centre out to Space Command to do on behalf of Defence. So our role and my role as a director will start to shape more towards the up and out policy strategy, the cross government work, working with BEZ, cabinet office into number 10, uh, supporting the National Space Council, et cetera, the kind of international touch points. So it's that more historic role of a director within MOD. Um, and then, providing the oversight, the direction, and in some cases, the holding to account of the, the front line in terms of Goddard's and Space Command on delivering the actual output for defense. And I'll let, I'll let Goddard talk a wee bit about that and how he sees that going forward. Yeah, um, you know, we've talked about this before, Harv, but I describe it as a, a, a Venn diagram, you know, and, and it's, you know, fairly well on top of each other at the moment in terms of that Ben, you know, there's a very large shaded bit in the middle. As we work out, and, you know, it's probably worth mentioning that we do speak uh, probably not once a day, but multiple times a day. And, uh, you know, uh, one of your guys has come across to be the chief of staff in, in uh, Space Command. So as you've said, you know, everything that you have put together, it is now up to us to deliver. And primarily in that military aspect, we are joint as the, uh, as the chief mentioned, it will be collaborative. So we will have interactions with, uh, with industry, but we've already got a commercial integration cell inside our space operations center. Um, and I think, you know, as the, as the circles of the Venn come apart, I think what will be left in the middle is very much that sort of, you know, the commercial aspects, the industrial uh, aspects there, um, UK Space Agency, you know, clearly uh, with your links into biz and the space agency, what we're going to do in terms of the future uh, National Space Operating Center. And also, I think the partners and allies sit in that middle bit as well. I've, per you know, I've kind of been in the role for about five weeks now. You know, it is the fire hose of learning in terms of uh, what you guys have been up to and what is out there in terms of space, whether it's UK or, or across the world. And I don't want to confuse the issue right now in terms of getting out and dealing with allies and partners, the US and so on. There's been a, the, the odd phone call here or there just to, you know, create the, uh, the initial communications. But I think we'll be very close, and we've talked about this, in terms of how we then step out, speak to people so that we, you can kind of do the introduction and then move back and let me continue in that, that sort of military sense. 
and uh, you know you very much in that policy and cross Whitehall way. So you know it definitely a, a Venn diagram that will change as we go through. And I think that's the beauty of this is um, we haven't got fixed paths here. We're just gonna um, you know there's guidance, there's direction, but I think we've got um, the ultimate flexibility to uh, to change this as we go through. Just following up on that, Goddard specifically, I guess, um, what, what are your current priorities for Space Command? I'm thinking not just sort of buildings and people, although clearly that is, but how to build a culture of a brand new command. Uh, it's exciting, but it's a big deal. Yeah, the, uh, I mean, I've kind of mentioned the cultural aspects there already, Sophie. The um, joint is a big one for me. Um, we are bound to have done this uh, underneath the the Royal Air Force previously, but a you know a large joint command, a bit like joint helicopter command, is definitely new. So you know there are aspects there of bringing Army, Navy, Air Force, Civil Service, and the Chief mentioned it at the beginning, and coalescing under the umbrella of, of space um, is one thing, and the collaborative nature is another. You know, as we said, um, the fact that this is sponsored by Airbus and FASI are enabling it. Um, you know, I do see industry, academia, DSDL in terms of the um, science and technology. It is one big, you know, collaborative group. So we're not going to be sat in the corner of High Wycombe doing our own thing and, and delivering what Harv throws over the fence. It is collaborating with everyone. And I think that's the, that, that's the culture. I think the final point on the culture is um, it would be easy, wouldn't it, to turn up and suddenly everything to be about space. It's not, you know, I think it's clear from the um, integrated review that space is a very much an enabling domain. You know, as the chief said, you know, I just our, our normal lives, let alone the military aspects of things, are dominated by space, by GPS, by communications, by um, satellite TV, you know, timing, all sorts of different things. Um, you know, we need to understand that side of it. We need to, um, you know, from a military perspective, um, look at the specifics that we look into, um, you know, space domain awareness. It, it, it's very similar that uh, we'll be looking at space debris, we'll be looking at, um, you know, other satellites, conjunctions, those sorts of things. You know, so that collaborative nature, um, I think, is, you know, 100% key. And it's also clear from the IR that space is an operational domain. If you look at Half put out a tweet maybe six months ago, was it Half, um, talking about, activities in the space domain um, by other nations that you know maybe not won't have or didn't have the best intent at that particular time um, so I, I think you'll start to see more of that sort of thing so you know it's about being space advocates not space zealots and it's about understanding that domain but very much joint very much collaborative um, I think I mentioned the timings but in terms of the priorities very quickly um, on the 1st of April, the Space Operations Center and RF Finingdale's come under um, Space Command. Um, they're operations that continue. So, you know, despite the fact you mentioned realistically that, you know, the first priority is getting the people, the, uh, the infrastructure and those sorts of things, but we can't let those things fail. You know, so the operations are absolutely at the top of the tree in terms of priorities. With the outcome of the, uh, the IR Defense Command paper, um, and then looking forward to the uh, national space strategy and the defense space strategy coming out um, around June timeframe, the next priority is then understanding and, uh, you know, through gathering all the stakeholders together, looking at a capability strategy that we can then take forward for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, you know, so that's definitely the second. And, and the third comes into, you know, the Space Academy part that uh, the Harm has mentioned previously in that, um, as part of my role, I become what's known as the training requirements authority. Um, and so we need to do a training and needs analysis. Ultimately, that is a cross defense. What do we need to do in training terms? You know, do we give a space module at Cranwell, at Dartmouth, at Sandhurst? You know, do we start early in all of the training courses for soldiers, sailors and airmen and just let them know what we do in space, what how space is important? Um, and then also, uh, you know, from the academy aspects, does space in itself become a, a trade group? Do we, you know, put people through apprenticeships um, in concert with uh, industry and so on and get MVQs, get qualifications out of the end that then feeds what becomes the, uh, 
um, you know, future space enterprise in the UK, not just military. So I think that training aspect, once we've worked the operational and then the, uh, the capability side of it, will definitely uh, follow on fairly soon. So those are the priorities, but you're right. Getting the people and having a building to go and work from, even though we're used to this virtual working, um, I think is a high priority. I don't know if Harv's got anything to add, but I'll just throw in one other um, point um, and perhaps in about three or four minutes, we'll, we'll start with our question session. But the final point thrown is just uh, any reflections on the implications of the IR and the um, command paper yesterday. Uh, over, over to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to close out on, you know, God has very eloquently summed it all up there and, the, and you know, the, his priorities as he goes forward there. But the... The one thing that we keep discussing is this isn't this is a journey. There's a journey to go on, and uh, even at the end of a two or three year tour for Goddard's uh, as the first commander, we probably won't have all of this lying flat. And there's an expectation that you know there's a, quite a bit of work to done and to be done, and we need to uh, be flexible and, and test and adjust as we take this whole construct through. Not just Space Command, but the broader national space strategy as we deliver that. Um, I keep banging on about this phrase of, you know, it's a national space strategy that needs to be delivered in a national way. And the MOD is just one part of that. There's so much uh, more to space than just the military side and the, uh, the cross government and the international collaboration is incredibly key here. And um, as, as God as stands up Space Command and gets it off and running, certainly from an MOD centre perspective, our focus will really start to shift into that uh, broader collaboration mode and, uh, and looking for those partnerships. In, in terms of IR, so I, I I've lost count of how many briefs I've given on what the new Defence Space Programme could and should be, from the Prime Minister to Dominic Cummings to Secretary of State to multiple four stars, you name it, we've briefed them all, all the way down to the Air Cadets, um, who were incredibly receptive. And if you're not aware of the Air Cadets, a space learning package that they've now developed through the Open University, go and have a look at it. It's absolutely exceptional. <laughs> Um, I only wish we had something like that rolled out in Space Command on day one. It is really, really very good. Um, but I think um, the phrase that I started all of these presentations with was, we are at an inflection point. Um, Cass touched on it at the start in terms of the space domain is changing fast. You know, for many years, it was relatively benign. In recent years, close decades, we've seen it exponentially start to change. Uh, and specifically in terms of the threats and how it's being contested and congested, but specifically for us in the military domain, focusing quite acutely on the threat, which uh, grows by the day. That sat alongside the personal ambition of the top of government and the prime minister in particular is very clear on his ambition for where we go with space and how we utilize it as a nation that sees itself as a, uh, you know, an R&D superpower by the year 2030. So I think this IR has been an inflection point for us. I think it has, has given us the stage to really land the narrative about space, to properly get formal and overt recognition of the importance of the domain, both in terms of what it does, enabling modern day life, the operational advantage in the military, but also the fact that it is an operational domain in its own right. And it should be treated in that way, no different than we treat air, land, maritime or cyber. Um, particularly, I, I think we have done a cracking job through the IR and, and the, the Defence Command paper on, on bedding in that narrative. And actually what I'm starting to see, and we wouldn't have seen this a couple of years ago, I'm seeing people that don't live and breathe space talking about space in the early parts of any planning discussions they're having. So that in itself has been a real win. And in many ways, and I'm sure Dave Jordan will uh, see the parallels here with his uh, historical uh, comparisons, but even in my short 30 years in the service, uh, way back when, we used to have to fight and bully our way into get the air narrative landed when you were planning 
uh, joint campaigns. Um, and I felt we kind of won that through recent campaigns. We're in a decent place now. We're getting there with space and I'm starting to see people really wake up to the importance of it and the fact that um, we've got to think about it and we've got to think about it up front because it's so, uh, it's so critical. So if nothing else, stand fast, the money, the plan, the people and this grand new ambition, which is all brilliant, it has allowed us to properly land the narrative and that is incredibly important because if you can't win that, then you don't go anywhere. So for me, that's probably the biggest takeaway of this last year. So if you don't, I, I noticed you've come up, which is, you know, is, is definitely the signal that uh, the we shut up at this particular point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the crook that's coming off. I did want to say one thing, you know, the, uh, echo everything that Harv has said about the IR cementing the importance of space. Um, and I, I, the stand up of Space Command, I think just in itself, whether I get it right, whether we get it right or, or not, has enabled already a bunch of conversations that I've had over the uh, over the last few weeks. So, for example, uh, you know, uh, I've got a lot of equity in the um, the Carrier Strike Group Twenty One um, that is sailing a bit later this year. I had a fantastic conversation with their team, starting with Steve Morehouse, the uh, uh, Commodore Steve Morehouse, who's the Carrier Strike Group Commander, down in the Spock last week. In terms of you know what information we can give them, the fact that we are putting a liaison officer onto HMS Queen Elizabeth and sailing. And I think the, the subsequent conversation that we've had, she will be, I think, front and center when it comes to, you know, day-to-day -day operations, you know, as well as having a, um, a daily weather brief, there'll be a daily space weather brief, you know, because that side of thing is important for satellite communications and so on. So already in that single operation, you know, we're, we're having a conversation. Um, we're going to do the same for land in, in various operations, uh, you know, and so on as much as we can. And, and uh, you know, I was chatting with the, uh, the three star, uh, new three star MSO this morning. Just the fact that Space Command has been prominent in the IR has already opened doors. So, you know, we've just got to keep them open from now on. Thanks, Golders. Um, that's fascinating. Uh, really interesting about the Space Liaison Officer on Queen Elizabeth. I'm going to hand over to uh, our first questioner, Managing Director of Airbus Defence and Space, our partner for the event. Um, over to you, Richard, for your question. Thank you, Sophie. Harv, Goddard, thank you very much for bringing to life in a little bit more detail your joint visions. Um, as the UK's sovereign space prime, we of course welcome the strong confirmation to both Skynet 6, the 5 billion, and especially the 1.4 billion to include the new UK built IS Air constellation you refer to, and this new supporting digital backbone in space. Could you provide some more detail on what those two new programmes may include? And now that you've landed the narrative in the IR and DSIS, how can we move at pace and not have to wait until April next year when it's fully stood up in Space Command? I, I can probably just start. Start. I, 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 Sorry, go ahead, Goddard. But, but, so I was just going to say, to answer the back end of the question there, Richard, and firstly, thank you for, um, as we mentioned before, Airbus hosting the event here. Um, you know, as I mentioned, where the operational side, the Spock is still running and the um, um, Finding Dells is still running. You know, I was remiss in mentioning that, um, you know, the communications are still running due to the Skynet um, constellation that, that, uh, that we've got up there. Um, as you know more than anyone, um, the capability aspects of that are up and running. They sit with Stratcom. Uh, at the moment, and we just literally, we have just come off meeting myself and half with uh, uh, the guys in Stratcom in terms of, you know, where I talked about a, a sort of two circle Venn, actually, this is a three circle Venn diagram with Stratcom. And one of the things that we did mention in there is that we, we have to do exactly what you're saying over the next year. We cannot wait until Space Command has reached IOC. We will be running this capability stuff. We will be informing Stratcom, they will be informing us. And the, the conversations that we have around this are key because it ties into the ISR side of things as well. You know, 
um, where are we going in the future? How is this going to look? What are our um, science and technology demonstrators at the moment that I'm sure we'll see more of in the next couple of years? So you're 100% right. We cannot wait until then. And, and I'm fortunate in that the, the small capability team that has come across um, from uh, Air Command into Space Command led by uh, Group Captain Rainer Owens have done a huge amount uh, in terms of capability there. Um, you know yourself, you know, the amount of interaction in and around with industry uh, and so on. So I think, you know, for me in Space Command, it is key that we keep doing those things. I'll just, I'll hand off uh, across to half of the, uh, the first part of that. I, so thanks, Richard. Um, probably two, two things which are most opposite. One is a program called Minerva, which has hitherto been called the Space Game Changer which we landed through the IR and it's actually being funded through the R&D pipeline and sponsored by the Defence Innovation Unit. Um, so the space game changer in very short uh, hand is looking at uh, the digital architecture, demonstrating a meaningful open digital architecture enabled by space-based assets so that we can move comms and data at speed around the globe. So Minerva is just standing up. The SRO will be Jules Ball, my one star. And we will run that with the R&D team to a point when Goddard and Space Command are, are suitably established with the right people, et cetera, and then we'll hand it off. But we're not gonna stand still on it. The, it looks like the money was protected through the IR. Uh, perhaps not all of it, but enough to certainly get it going. Um, and that work will be kicking off here in earnest. Uh, in fact, it goes to the IAC this Thursday and Jules is in front of that board, uh, you know, landing the, landing the deal. The last point, sorry, Sophie, the last point uh, which will be of interest to you is, as well, you know, we have the Artemis program in terms of Leo Smallsat constellation. Uh, aspirations. There are also multiple other uh, programs around the bazaars, mostly sitting in DSTL as TDPs. Um, I have just recently directed the team to bring all of that work together into a single ISR project and to take the goodness out of each of those programs and look at how we would harness all of that into a single meaningful ISR program that will be delivered and sit within a pipeline of different activities. And the pipeline concept is just going to the four stars this week. Um, and again, you know, hot off the press type thing. We're just, we're just, I was just closing out on that today with my team. So um, it's still early days as to what that will look like but the team are they're working through that at the moment. What I would say is Goddard's and I, there's a, there's a bit of settling on this through the next couple of months. And then in and around the June, July time, we are looking to plan for a space industry engagement, most probably a day event, where we can put much more meat on the bones of all of this to industry and clearly demonstrate where our minds are, and more importantly, where the opportunities lie and how we intend to take it forward. But hopefully that helps. Probably not the full answer you were after, but hopefully you know, we're, on a, we're on a path. Thanks. That's great, so, thanks. Thanks so much, um, Harv. I'm now going to hand over to, uh, for a question to uh, Lord David Willits, our Conservative peer. Good to have you here, Lord Willits. Uh, thank you very much, Sophie. And it's been fascinating to, to hear about this initiative, and I, which I very strongly support. Um, I wanted to follow on from Harb's final comment, really, to ask about the post-Galileo environment, what plans he might have on position, navigation and timing, um, and the extent to which now that the government has its strategic stake in OneWeb, he sees OneWeb as an asset, especially as we move from Gen 1 to planning for Gen 2, that he would incorporate in his planning. Uh, thanks, Lord Willits. Good question uh, and very timely, given recent discussions in the House of Lords, etc. 
uh, which we very uh, happily support it. But uh, firstly, I'll caveat up front in that the space-based PNT program doesn't doesn't sit within defence, and it's actually being delivered from within the space agency under the SRO ship of Ian Amott, who's doing an, an exceptional job, if I can be so bold as to say, putting proper programmatic rigor around that a uh, space-based PNT program, which was originally the UK GNSS program, and then we did a major reset through last summer, yeah. which was absolutely the right thing to do. The stage that we're at at the moment, I, so I sit on the sponsors group of that um, uh, program alongside the SRO and various others. Um, we have uh, gone out with an RFI to industry. All the industry inputs have come in and we're just going through the down select process. And actually, we did quite a bit of this work last week, looking at what's meeting the different requirements set. The key takeaway for me is, and this I think was the sticking point for what was UK GNSS at the start, we don't want to just simply replicate what already exists. We don't want to copy a GSS or a Galileo. We don't necessarily want or need 24 satellites in MEO. We want to do PNT resilience in a different way yeah. so that we can offer that in terms of a a meaningful, resilient option to others so that we're, we have a seat at the table and particularly with our US counterparts who are really interested in what ideas we can come up with that aren't 24 satellites in NEO. Um, on, the, on the topic of OneWeb, I think from what I would observe is OneWeb have played in to the RFI so they've offered, here's how we think we could skin that cat in terms of provision of PNT resilience using mostly low earth orbits. Um, and that's being considered as part of that broader discussion at the moment. It's too early to say how that's going to shape up. I, I probably wouldn't uh, even offer a view on it since I'm not the SRO, but I think the next three to six months will be quite a pivotal and interesting as we start to just narrow down on okay, what, what could be on offer here? And obviously OneWeb will undoubtedly be part of the discussion. I think the um, uh, the only thing I'd add to that, Lord Willits, is I think the, the point that Half makes at the end with uh, OneWeb being part of that particular conversation is this will be the way of the future, the, that sort of dual role, multi-role aspect of whatever we have in orbit, in, you know, whether it's low Earth orbit, whether it's medium or, or geostationary Earth orbit. And I know from a, um, a capability perspective, clearly that is something, especially as technology increases day by day, that, uh, you know, we'll be looking at all the time, whether it's dual use military civilian, whether it is just multi-role in that particular satellite. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Dr. John Paffett, who's Managing Director of Space Focused SME KISP. Um, over to you, John. Thanks, Sophie. Um, oh, I've got us. It's great to, have, um, to listen to you earlier, and it's, and it's really good to see space getting recognised in the IR. And obviously, we, we wait eagerly to, to see the release of the space strategy. The UK for many years has been at the forefront of space system development um, and pioneers in areas like the small satellites and small satellite engineering. A lot of that capability that exists and a lot of the innovation arises within small to medium enterprises. If space is going to be incorporated into the future defence strategy in the way that we think it is going to be, what procurement and engagement reforms are anticipated so that the SMEs can be better engaged and the capabilities can be accessed, accessed and leveraged. Shall I, shall I um, start on that one, Goddard, and then I'll hand off? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, firstly, John, thanks. Had a great discussion earlier today with Anita, so uh, he's keeping me on the straight and narrow as ever. Um, but I would uh, I'd just say, so you're absolutely on the money. Um, the the requirement for agile acquisition and acquisition transformation has not a, you know, gone unnoticed. It's a definite area that we've discussed. Uh, Goddard and I have talked about it. We've had a great discussion with DENS who have moved that pace and are on the cusp of 
uh, redesigning a new space uh, delivery team. The CEO there, Sir Simon Bollum, is completely bought in. We had a session with him and his management board recently, and he was absolutely adamant that this new space DT would be doing things in a much more agile, different, fast-paced uh, manner, uh, not your normal CADMID cycle lethargic big programs that we've seen in the past. We just can't afford to be like that with some of this capability or we'll just get outpaced by the technology. We've been doing everything we can in terms of trying to demonstrate the intent of a, a defence space to move at pace. You'll have seen some of that last November when we did the International Space Pitch Day and we let upwards of a, a million pounds worth of contracts through a, a Dragon's Den affair. Um, you know, we are desperately keen to look at uh, best practice in the commercial sector. We've been speaking with companies like Seraphim, uh, venture capitalists, all sorts. Uh, we, you and I have spoken, uh, albeit a little while ago, um, but we are definitely looking to leverage the commercial uh, aspect of space acquisition. And you mentioned the, the strategy. The basis of the strategy will be this idea of what do we need to own? Where do we need to collaborate? And what can we simply access? And I, uh, you know, the access is easy. We'll just buy it off the shelf because it exists and somebody's doing it the way we want it already. So we'll just buy that. But the where do we own and where do we collaborate? I think the collaborate bit, there is as much in that in terms of partnerships and capability as there are in learning from industry on how to do agile space acquisition. Um, and we have a hill to climb here. I am absolutely sure of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think just going back to my point earlier about June, July for a space industry day, this is a topic that certainly I would like to have uh, talked about at that industry day and perhaps have industry uh, do some presentations to us on here's how we think we, you could do this in a, in a quicker, more agile way. This phrase that we've been using through the IR at the speed of relevance uh, in a, you know, in an information age operating and delivering at the speed of relevance, absolutely key. And that's as much to do with acquisition and sustainment models as anything else. But any, anyway, I'll hand over to Goddard's there. Clearly, you've said everything I was going to say half there, honest. Mm -hmm. um, no, just a couple of extra things, actually, from, a, from an Air Command perspective, their space team have moved over to us. And I think what they have learned from the Air Command capability teams over the last few years is the benefits of that rapid capability office that has been put together. Um, so, you know, uh, a small team of people that is, is able to kind of, you know, primarily the sort of the commercial aspects of this really quickly and get into that, you know, it's a, a sometimes overused term, but that fail fast. And I think what we've learned from that, um, I know, uh, you know, many of you out there will have heard of the, uh, the Carbonite um, satellite, which was, eight months for a small satellite to be put into orbit to give the first, as I understand it, um, color video from low Earth orbit as a technology demonstrator. And I think what we've learned there will be, as Harv mentioned, you know, that was part of the discussion with Sir Simon Bollum and, and DNS. So even in some of those bigger procurement programs, you know, where Skynet um, is definitely one of those, that there will be, you know, some uh, due process to follow. I think across the rest of uh, uh, rest of the enterprise, we can definitely, definitely, definitely speed things up. Um, and just, I know Sophie's come in, one final point is that um, Harv and I did a, I, I, I'd never been to Harwell before, a space cluster. So that's a place up in Abingdon, 105 different companies, a thousand people all in the space industry. And Dr. Joanna Hart, when she showed us around there, you know, I'd never seen any of this. We worked with the, you know, the space catalog, uh, catapult people. We went to um, Oxford Space Systems. We went to a multitude of different places. We saw the um, satellite test facility that is going up there. I think it's harnessing something like that, what goes on there. And already after that day, I'm already looking at maybe putting um, either two or three days a week, maybe all week, someone working up there just to start seeing what's out there, joining the dots and see what we can do, you know? So 
we're, as Hal mentioned at the beginning, you know, we talk about being right at the beginning of the journey, but I think that journey is going to be flexible as we move along, as long as we get the right people in the right places. That's fascinating. Thanks, Godders. Um, I'm next going to hand over to Darren Jones, MP, who is chair of the Bayes Select Committee. Darren, over to you. Thanks, Sophie, and congratulations to you and the Institute for such a, a great event today. I think the numbers of participants show um, how topical uh, this is. Um, Lord Willits anticipated my question on OneWeb, which we're inquiring into at the moment, so I won't push you further on that. Um, but with my other hat on as a member of the National Security Joint Committee, I'm interested to hear your views about how we meet the ambitions in the integrated review for a more integrated approach across government departments, and therefore what uh, an operational level do you anticipate will need to change uh, in terms of your day-to-day -day delivery and leadership between the MOD and probably the Cabinet Office and Bayes? Uh, that's probably one for me and I, I actually think we're already well down that journey, um, mostly because of the space, the outcome of the Space Landscape Review which we undertook through last year which no doubt you're aware of um, and where that has left us is, uh, well, your own departments in Bayes standing up an equivalent space directorate with a director space, which is proving already it's, it's weight and gold with Rebecca Everton in there and the team starting to build. And just the fact that we're able to do that, uh, to work together director to director, we speak practically every day. And in many ways, this is a, this, this idea of my role here with a foot into cross government, speaking to Rebecca with, her and I co-leading this virtual national space policy unit, delivering against a national space strategy, which has been agreed up through the Space Council by the PM, et cetera. And then my other foot down and in into Space Command, linking all of that national strategy and the collaboration cross government into commercial, civilian, et cetera, and ensuring that what's being delivered through defense is coherent with that. So it's, it's quite a critical role, uh, this director space and space directorate within MOD. In terms of a coherent cross-government space governance, I think we're well on a path to that. Just the fact that we've got the two space directorates is helping. The fact that we're doing a joined up co-authoring approach to the national space strategy, and importantly, have now established all the right three-star and two-star working groups to bring in all the other relevant departments of state, DFT, DCMS, et cetera, et cetera, are now all coming to those three and two-star meetings and offering up their requirements from space. And we're ensuring that they're captured within a national space strategy. And it comes back to that point of mine from earlier of national space strategy delivered in a national way where all departments of state are pulling together to deliver it. We just happen to be on point and Secretary of State for Bayes just happens to be under the spotlight from the PM, uh, but doing a phenomenal job pulling that all together. And in fact, we've got another session this Thursday with Secretary of State Bayes. And you know, we're already at a point where we're discussing a 10 point plan, what the meat should be on the bones of the skeleton for the strategy. I think it's gonna be really very exciting. I, you know, I, I think we're definitely on the right path to deliver a coherent product. And I think that's the gist of your question there. Do, do we do, are we going to do this in a coherent way? And um, I'm very confident that we've now got the right governance structure in, in place to allow for that. Hopefully, hopefully that answers. I also, uh, there was just one thing I was going to add, you know, from the sort of the military perspective, from the Space Command uh, perspective, I think that coherence is key, the command and control aspect of that. Um, and, you know, space and cyber, are, are, quite a lot go in the, uh, in the same sentence these days, but, the, you know, the National Cyber Force and, and how they are doing things are working closely there, or at least observing and looking for lessons identified and how they are doing. Um, their work to see what is relevant on our side of things. I mentioned earlier, you know, I had a really good conversation with the, um, the three star that will sit working for CDS in, the, in our uh, strategic headquarters in, in MOD today. He's just coming into the job in the, uh, in the next couple of weeks, General Walker. Um, and it was very much that 
that you know these sorts of considerations how the, the um, all of the cross government levers work to get the right effect at the uh, at the end of the day thanks thanks so much for that um next question um, we've got uh, three more we'd really like to fit in and only a little bit of time so we'll see what we can do uh i just like to call on colonel mike fayers who's a student on the uh, high commander staff uh, course and and joins us obviously with a an army hat on an army hat thank you very much uh very kind words uh, so thank you to the society this afternoon i have a question really that i think builds upon some of the previous themes uh, about um, the importance of the domain, coordination across government and coherence. And it's really about a question about modern deterrence. So I wondered if modern deterrence is a really prominent theme, both in MOD, NATO and with our allies, uh, with clear implications on society, industry members here today and other government agencies. And I wonder if you could share your thoughts on how space deterrence uh, might be created from UK perspective with the announcements we saw uh, yesterday, and also how this might contribute to a wider deterrence mandate. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, if, if I jump in there quickly, Harv, and leave you with a difficult bit, um, I think, you know, one of the things deterrence comes about when we can tell people about what capabilities there are and what is happening up there, you know, most of the time. And you know, certainly in recent past, um, quite a lot of what is happening in the space domain, as in some of the other domains, actually, is highly classified. So I think what, what we need to do, and I know the US are looking at this as well, is, you know, I'm going to say the term declassification program. That's, you know, it's, it's nothing that formal initially, but start to look at where we can talk to the, you know, there's a thousand people on this event, um, where, where we can talk to uh, the general public as well as everyone else in terms of why we are doing certain things, why we are putting a particular satellite up there um, because of certain things that are happening. And I, I mentioned right at the beginning, you know, that it seems like a big thing that we managed a tweet, but half putting out the tweet that was calling out, you know, nefarious behavior in space is the start of that journey to understanding the deterrence aspect because i think once we're over that particular hump um, and we can demonstrate why it is an operational domain why it is an enabling thing, then you know we can get into um, why we have particular capabilities why we're partnering you know we haven't gone too far yet but um, you know whether it's nato whether it's um, the sort of five I construct, the uh, combined space operations construct, getting agreement, getting um, consensus within those, I think is incredibly important so that, um, you know, we, it, it is not just the UK trying to do this. It is a whole range of partners. But, but for me, it is that declassification so that we can talk about a lot of these things. I, think okay. I would just close. Okay. I would just let me just close off there, Sophie, just by saying it's a it's a very live topic. We've just commissioned some work to take through this summer, uh, in terms of a uh, food for thought papers for NATO, particularly through the lens of spaces deterrence. Um, you know what we what we in the UK have may have delivered through the IR still doesn't necessarily deliver us in the UK the complete uh, capability to be able to do space on our own. So this idea of, uh, yes, communicating, having the credibility and having the capability, the capability for us needs to come through the lens of the collaborations that we have and NATO is absolutely key to that. Um, I'm just about to bring a new member onto my team who have particularly specifically headhunted out of the cabinet office who's been doing deterrence through the IR to take on this work through the summer. Angus Lapsley's really focused on it, um, as is the Secretary of State. Um, but we need to remember two things. One, that just uh, deterrence doesn't necessarily have to happen in a single domain. So there might, there might be something happen in space, but we could deter in another domain, let's say cyber or, or whatever. Um, and the other that actually where the UK is really leading here in terms of a deterrent posture is on the soft power side and the work that we've been supporting through FCDO into a new UN resolution in terms of 
uh, acceptable space norms of behavior. And if we, if our plans come together this autumn, you'll see us do an FCDO sponsored Wilton Park affair, where we're bringing in members from all over the globe to absolutely land this new narrative and force through the, uh, the resolution on uh, new acceptable norms of behavior. That in itself is the starting point for what deterrence can be over. And finally, um, we, we're really nearly out of time. I'm just going to maybe let things run over for a minute or two just to bring in, um, uh, I'm going to bring in together first Ali Stickings from a research fellow at RUSI and secondly, group captain Chris Mullen, uh, an HCSC RAF student. And I'm going to get them to ask their questions one after the other and then I'll just let you both um, pick up what you can from each of those questions to uh, finish wrapping up. So first off, Ali, over to you. Thanks, Sophie. Um, my question actually follows on from what Harv just, just finished speaking about, um, looking at the, those norms of responsible behaviour. Um, and maybe just to, uh, if you could expand a bit more on, on how you envisage um, the role of Space Command in you know, any future UK work on this, how it's moving forward, what's the relationship with FCDO on this, and, and just your thoughts more broadly on how you see the responsibility of militaries and defense internationally within these dialogues um, and, and any future agreements that go forward on, on limitations, on capabilities, on, on, on what behaviors are, are acceptable. Um, because uh, you know, so far we haven't seen, I don't think defense as involved in these discussions as, as perhaps we'd like to see. Chris, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sophie. And uh, it's as if you stage manage this as my question really kind of links into Ali's. I mean, the chief did talk about, uh, again, about those normative behaviours, about questionable activity and the weaponization of space by some of the states. However, this last week we've seen Astra Scale launch Elsa D in terms of um, debris clearance, which uses rendezvous technology, which from a dual use perspective presents that dilemma of weaponizing space. And as well as maybe working through the UN and working from Space Command, I wonder if you could comment on how we can use industry and the commercial sector to try and shape those normative behaviours and to shape what is acceptable as we move forward. Thanks, sir. Shall I shall I start, Goddard? Since uh, you know we so on the on the norm side, I mean obviously we're so first thing FCDO is in the lead. Uh, we're supporting, we've been very, very closely supporting um, and you know, Goddard has touched on it a couple of times in terms of us overtly calling out nefarious activity, etc. Um, and, you know, that in itself, just getting to that point uh, where we could have that type of public engagement does take some quite deft cross-government collaboration and, and a coherent approach. But We've got very good mechanisms in place now. I would just say that from a going forward perspective, even with the Space Command stand up, we would still, because this very firmly sits in the policy area uh, and very firmly sits in terms of strategic messaging, we would still see Space Directorate being the touch point in the cross government liaison on how we would do that type of engagement. But that doesn't mean to say we may not then use Space Command to enact some of that. Um, and we'd have to see how that would play out. I would just say on your point, Ali, uh, actually this, this one topic of uh, norms and behaviours has been a real focus area for Shriver War Games. So from a military perspective, we, we have been intimately looking at it um, and really starting to develop our thinking, not just nationally but across the alliance and that in itself has been a challenge because obviously certain nations have a different approach to what's acceptable and what isn't um, so but the strength in our deterrent posture will come from the alliance so we have to have those discussions and we need to work that all through um, i think my last point mindful of time is just just on a, a on your question, Chris, is absolutely there is as much a role to play here for commercial as there is for military or government. Um, and I think as we see more and more the commercialization of space and big proper big companies, you know, batting at a level that is equivalent to a state nation like SpaceX, etc., 
where they're dominating the market and commercializing in a big way. And they, it won't be, it won't be uh, before long that we see people like SpaceX have much, as much of a say in what goes on up there as a, as a state would. So that kind of brings me back to that starting point. That's why it's important to really get lying flat the recognized and accepted international norms of the regulations that will govern a space that is actually future proofing rather than looking back to a 1967 outer space treaty. Over. The, the only thing I'd add to that is, um, is allied to that 1967 space treaty in that it's not surprising really that, you know, when we talk gray zone, when we talk sub threshold, that a lot of these things happen in space domain, happen in the, in the cyber domain because of the unregulated nature of these domains. So it has to be a sort of global ambition as, uh, you know, as we progress here to start bringing in, you know, norms and behaviors, regulation, that sort of thing. You know, just talking about the amount of satellites, there's, there's two and a half thousand satellites up there at the moment. Uh, Harv just mentioned Starlink and SpaceX, um, you know, possibly 15,000, possibly 30,000 um, satellites in, Leo, you know, and that's outside of all the other companies that want to do it. China are, are, you know, 40 plus expected heavy launches this year. You know, the place is really getting congested. It's getting contested. I mentioned space debris earlier. Um, I think the stat is 128 million um, items of space debris. Uh, and ISS, you, some of you may have noticed in the news, you know, released a massive battery pack. Uh, two and a half ton battery back as big as a, an SUV um, last week or, or the week before. And I think the Astro scale thing is really interesting as well, Chris, on your point, where I think we come back to transparency because clearly one person's debris cleanup um, and old satellite cleanup could be another person's nefarious um, anti-satellite um, kind of instrument. So I think the transparency in what we do, which comes back to space domain awareness and getting that information out and about, calling out those activities is 100% key. I know we're over time and uh, you know, we could probably go on for longer on that one, but great questions, thank you. Thank you so, so very much. And yes, I think we could go on for longer. Perhaps we'll have to have you back <laughs> again at some point. So. Uh, I just want to say, well, particularly thanks to you both, to uh, Harv and to Goddard's, um, and of, of course, Goddard's very, very best of, uh, you don't need luck really, but all the very best for your uh, first weeks and months in Space Command. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to thank Airbus again for their help and support, and Chief of the Air Staff, uh, Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston, for joining us uh, for this afternoon, which was a, re a really nice extra pleasure. Um, and finally, this big audience, it's amazing to see how many hundreds of you have joined in. I think when Harv mentioned we're at an inflection point, it's time to land the narrative of space. To see this many people involved means that Freeman Air and Space Institute will obviously want to hold further events and, and continue these discussions and we'll look at ways of doing that. Just for now, um, if you're thinking about future events, I'd mentioned for your diaries, that will be showcasing women in air and space power on the afternoon of 11th of May and hosting another fireside chat, this time with Air Marshal Andy Turner, who's going to reflect on the integrated review and yesterday's announcements. So that, um, that is all from me. I think that's all my thank yous. And, it, and, oh, and I would also obviously like to thank our panelists for great questions, which provoked lots of interesting answers. I'll let you uh, enjoy your evening. Have a lovely one. And thank you again from Freeman Air and Space Institute for joining us for this event. Bye.